I think we are just less than two minutes into the session, so let's get ready for it now. We don't have a limit, right, for how many people are joining? No, I don't think so. I think uh, we have a capacity of around 500 people. Okay. I was just, I'm asking just because I see people that are double connected. Maybe they try one device and they didn't work. Um, but if we don't have a limit, then it's no problem. Okay. So hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to Youth for Nature's first online session for 2020. We are really so much excited to have you here on World Health Day for this live Q&A session on birds and COVID-19 with our three remarkable speakers. Kindly note that, that this Q&A session is hosted by Youth for Nature an international youth-led organization advocating for nature-based solutions in climate action. We do this through our three main objectives of one, uh, mobilizing for youth to advocate for political leaders to deliver up to 30% of natural, of climate solutions required by 2030 using nature-based solutions. Two, to elevate youth voices by giving them a platform to share their stories and actually have them be heard. And three, to build the capacity of youth to act as leaders in a nature for climate movement. We have three pillars of work, which are storytelling, knowledge sharing, and capacity building. My name is Kaluki Paul Mutuku. I'll be your host for today, and I'm the regional coordinator for Youth for Nature at the African region. And an exciting thing about me is that I really do love nature. I love forest walks, and I love the beautiful smell in natural places. Well, to know more about uh, Youth for Nature, please visit www.youthfornature.org or follow us on our social media channels at Youth for Nature to enable you know more about us and how you can be a part of our movement. Kindly note that this session will take uh, roughly 60 minutes, so we'll try to ensure that we save as much time as possible to give our remarkable speakers time to respond and our remarkable participants more time to ask questions. Before we get into it, allow me to uh, set some house rules that we should go by so that we ensure we have a very interactive session. Uh, and as, as you saw in the previous uh, slide, we shall be using Slido to receive uh, your questions. So we kindly request that you go to slido.com, type in the code 77525, I repeat, go to slido.com and type in 77525 as your code to access and join as you share your question. We also want to make sure that this virtual session is as cozy and, uh, and uh, personal as possible. So we also request that while sending your questions, you please in include your name and also the country or wherever you're joining us from. 
And a cool thing about Slido is that you can actually like the questions that you like most. So we also ask that you like as many questions that you would want responded to by our remarkable speakers, because we'll be prioritizing, uh, we'll be prioritizing on our, on our uh, popular questions. Finally, to keep things uh, running smoothly, I ask all of you to kindly mute your microphones and keep your cameras off, with the exception of our speakers and maybe our proper speakers. Thank you so much. Now, before we present your speakers, to you, our speakers, I, I welcome you to type in the year. Uh, your name and where you're joining us from. Go ahead, Amanda. Um, well, I'm from Costa Rica originally, but right now I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm doing my PhD here at Emory University. And um, was there something else that I was going to say? <laughs> not, that is, that's actually okay. So okay. sorry, that was not for you, okay. for the participants. So I'm seeing people oh, from okay. Canada, Mexico, US, Italy. Oh, this is amazing. Mexico again. I'm seeing Kenya. I'm seeing France, Netherlands. Wow, that is so amazing. So we are so very excited to have you here. I'm seeing Colombia, uh, UK. So thank you so much. We hope that uh, it will be an interactive session. Thank you, uh, Philippines, Germany, Bolivia. Thank you so much. Welcome to the session again. So perfect. Let me get to introduce our remarkable speakers the day. First off, let me introduce Rodrigo Medellin. Rodrigo is a Mexican biologist from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, with a PhD from Gainesville University. I hope I got that correct. He has produced over, thank you. He's produced over 200 publications, including 98 scientific articles and more than 50 books and book chapters on the ecology of birds, conservation, and mammal diversity. He has played a leading role in many institutions, including IUCN and CITES, and has received numerous awards, including the Whitley Prize. He was recently in included as the National Geographic's uh, ninth explorer at large. So kindly wave to the audience and introduce yourself, Rodrigo. Hi, well, Paul has said, uh pretty much uh, uh, what, what you would like to know. I mean, I've been on working on bats for many decades. I work on other animals. I'm mostly interested in doing uh, research for conservation implementation in all kinds of different ways at the local and international level, uh, bats and jaguars and other things. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Next on, uh, Allow me to introduce Luis Roberto Viguez. Hope I got that correct, <laughs> Viguez. He's a biologist from University of Costa Rica. His work has centered on bat research and how environmental changes and natural processes affect the dynamic uh, of wildlife disease and immune modulation in bats. During his master's, Luis studied how deforestation and forest fragmentation affected the number of uh, infected bats with Trypanosoma and Leishmania in Southeast Mexico. He is currently a senior PhD uh, candidate at Ulm, at Ulm University working on the effect of migration on the immune system of the tequila bat. His, his new passion during this time, so pandemic is actually playing darts and looking through the window wishing to go outside. Kindly wave to the participants. Please. Hi, can, can you hear me well? Can, can anyone hear me? Hear yes. me? Yes, okay. Yeah, basically that's what I'm doing and I'm here to answer any questions that we, that you might have and let's see how it goes. I don't know, it sounds better because I thought my microphone was doing a lot of noise, but is this producing a lot of echo or is it better with the other one? That's, that's perfect, we can hear you well, Luis. Okay, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Luis. And last but not least, uh, allow me to introduce Amanda. Amanda Vicente is a disease ecologist from Costa Rica, where she studied a bachelor's and master's degrees in biology with emphasis in genetics and cellular biology. 
She's currently a PhD candidate at Emory, and her dissertation aims to understand the effects of anthropogenic disturbance on cave-dwelling birds, communities, and their demographic, health, status, and disease dynamics, combining field surveys with molecular and immunological methods, spatial analysis, and math models. Now, on our fan side, Amanda loves trailing, trail running and outdoor activities, so I guess she's closer to nature like me. So kindly <laughs> work with the participants, Amanda. Hi, everyone. I'm really, it's really my pleasure to be here, and I hope we could answer some interesting questions. So we'll see how that goes. I'm also very Thank excited so at how diverse this group is. This is amazing. Exactly. Thank you so much. I'm happy because we are joining from all over the world and really we strongly appreciate the three of you for joining us today and getting the time to answer some of the tough questions people have been having around pandemic, this pandemic and also around how we should uh, strategize for the future. Okay, so now let's dive in with our first uh, audience question. And if, if you don't mind, Paul. If you don't mind, Paul, sorry to interrupt. I would just like to make a disclaimer here. Uh, I see that uh, we have a, an audience of over 300 people that go from a very, uh, very well-known bat scientist to people who are learning about bats, to so people who are interested in bats but don't know much. So I'm going to ask the audience to be a bit patient uh, in the sense that we're going to try to be as clear as possible and as basic as possible, but we have to uh, assume a certain level of knowledge and we are going to avoid as much as possible any kind of technical jargon, any kind of concept that is not uh, common, common, common knowledge uh, out there. So with that, I'll go ahead and lead us into the questions. Thank you, Rodrigo. Indeed, yeah, we are not to speak about the technical terms that we are supposed to have each, uh, each person understand the issues. So yeah, right to our first question. I'm, I'm asking, someone is asking, why are bats gener generally asymptomatic carriers of many diseases? Do they have a specific immune system or something special? Please point to that, please. You wanna take that, Amanda Riquez? Riquez. Okay. You go ahead and now, yeah. Yeah. So what we know about bats is that when we when we think about wildlife and their pathogens, there is a large history of coevolution, right? So we know that this species have been in contact with those pathogens for many, many thousands of years. So when we see that the bats are asymptomatic, it might be that. Um, as well as we have some pathogens that for us might not have any effect on, on our health. But if we were to expose, for example, other, other simians to these pathogens, they might have an impact, right? So this large coevolution history between the pathogens and the wildlife makes them uh, more resistant. And there's several theories of why bats um, seem to be able to live a long life without developing the symptoms of the disease or developing the symptoms of a virus or pathogens, right? Not being affected completely. Uh, we're not going to go into all those theories because they are, um, and this is something that is really important. Everything that we're saying now is as the date today is the what? <laughs> the 7th of April. So this is an ongoing field, right? There's papers coming out every single day about this. So everything that we are talking about today is to, our, to the best of our knowledge up to date. It might be that in two weeks we have better answers, especially because research is moving at uh, uh, light speed right now. You see every day uh, things coming out. So what makes bats really good in, in, in having pathogens or, well, they are a highly diverse group. So when we talk about bats in general, we're talking about the second largest groups, uh, the second largest group of mammals, which means that they feel a lot of ecological niches and which means that bats are exposed to many things everywhere. Um, they seem to be highly resistant to, various, to, to the virus and we don't know if this has to do with the immune system or with this coevolutionary history 
also they really they live a really long life. So compared to mice, for example, bats, um, maybe having this collecting of different pathogens for longer in life. That's when we catch a bat and we study what virus or what other pathogens might be within that bat. We might find the collection of everything from the years uh, before, right? So because they live a longer life, they have a, a longer collective period for this. Um, so the, sh the short answer is we really don't know what's going on. We know that the bats are, are, are able to live long lives, uh, even when they have certain pathogens within them. But um, there's something about the immune system for sure. We cannot really put our finger on, our finger on it and say what exactly it is uh, that is giving them this ability to overcome or outlive the infections. I don't know if Amanda, you have something else to add to this? Yeah, I think um, there are a couple of things that I just wanna maybe just go back to what you said. Um, one particularly uh, special things that bats have is that they're the only flying mammal that it exists. And through their evolution of flight, there were a lot of adaptations that come with it. So you have to think of like, for instance, um, there, it, flight by itself is a highly, uh, it's a really costly metabolic activity uh, physiologically. And for instance, a human, when it's running full speed, it could reach, you could increase your metabolic rate to three times, but a bat would increase its metabolic rate up to 15 times where they're flying. So you have like to picture how costly that could be. So on those highly metabolic activities, there's a lot of um, byproducts like um, radical free oxygen molecules that could make some cellular damage. And the bats had evolved a way to, to compensate for that damage and still live, and there's, there's theory behind trying to understand how that could work on how, uh, how they have this huge longevity because they're, you know, for, for another mammal the same size, they were expected to live up to two years, but they, we have records of three living bats that could live for 40 years, which is amazing. And we're still trying to understand how that mechanism works, but it also looks that this could explain as well how they could cope with infections because they have this really good mechanism to repair their cell damage and to um, have this alert kind of um, like alert status in their immune system where they could cope and stop infection really quick. And um, if humans would have this, we will have this inflammation system of like, you know, we, we cannot cope with this huge amount of awareness in our immune system. This is just not how our evolution worked. Um, okay. But with them, with all these viruses that had evolved with them, they have to kind of go about that high, high bar of evolutionary system that they had with their immune system. Um, and you have to think of these, you know, host pathogen interactions like an arm race, right? So like the pathogens wants to prevail in this host and the host wants to get rid of this pathogen. So they have had this really intrinsic um, and really long whole evolutionary history. So for us, they might seem like they're doing well uh, because they have evolved together. But then when you put these viruses in other contexts, in other hosts, you take them out of their evolutionary history. And we, of course, haven't, haven't experienced this um, arms race coevolution with these hosts. So for, for us, they're completely new, we're completely susceptible, and we don't have the same mechanisms to deal with their um, attacks. So. And, and one more thing that I'd like to add is that to please keep in mind that given what we said before, that bats are the uh, second largest uh, order of mammals, but they're also the first most ecologically diverse group of mammals. That means that we cannot say that a bat is a bat is a bat. There's so many different variations in the natural history of the species and the ecology of the species in the 
um, uh, immune, uh, immunology of the species that in the metal metabolism of the species that there's but for every type of circumstance with low metabolisms, high metabolisms, very long lived, very short lived, all kinds of things. So keep in mind that bats is a just huge, huge composite of uh, of animals that go uh, that go from a three or four uh, year longevity to fifty four now, which is the record, and and in between there's a huge, huge span. Uh, that means that everything we say has to have its different. Uh, um, uh, qualifications as as uh, as they are adapt, uh, applied to bats. The only thing that bats share is that they do uh, have wings. They're the only mammals that fly, and they have a very very long history. There's a, there's at least uh, 52 million years of shared history, uh, but uh, beyond that, they're very very diverse in every way. Okay. Thank you so much, Atrio. You those are very in-depth. Uh, I mean, responses from coevolution to immune systems being strong and also the longevity of your life. You know, also being special as the only flying mammals. I think this is a very nice uh, summary of, of the first question. So thank you so much. On to the next question. JK from Malaysia is asking: uh, Public persecution of bats is increasing due to the media coverage on COVID-19 and bats. How can scientists stop the persecution of bats by the public or by the media? Who would want to answer that? Rodrigo? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was uh, something. Can you, can you please repeat the question, Paul? Sure, sure. Let me repeat it again. So JK from Malaysia is asking uh, that public persecution of bats is increasing due to media coverage on COVID-19 and bats. How can scientists stop the persecution of bats by the public or by the media? Thank you very much for that question. Exactly that is the problem that we have been facing, uh, not only with this coronavirus, bats are probably the most unfairly treated animals in the world. There's many animals that have a negative uh, public image from sharks to snakes to spiders to bats, but none has a more unfairly uh, negative image than, than bats. So what we can do as scientists, and not only scientists, everyone in the public can do that, is to continue promoting the good name of bats because of the so many ecosystem services that touches every day of our lives, uh, from seed dispersal to pollination to pest control, and pest control not only of agricultural pests, but also mosquitoes and other uh, vectors that can actually transmit like malaria and dengue and uh, chikungunya, sick, etc. Uh, so what you can do best is to get yourself educated about bats and there's a lot of information out there in the, in the web. Just make sure that, uh, that your source is good, that is very well uh, uh, grounded, based and fundamented in, uh, behind with good studies and you'll be fine by promoting the good name of bats that they really, really need. They, they need the help of scientists and everyone else. Thank you so much. And I think there's also the role of media to give scientists a space to share with them, yeah? Okay, yeah. so, okay, sure, thank you so much. So next one, Tamara is asking, oh, sorry, Tamara is asking, why do we hear many, uh, mainly about bats uh, as culprits, just like uh, in the pangolin route? Did you, so, did you, can I repeat it? Sorry, we, we, so why do we hear mainly about bats or bats pangolin round as culprits, right? That's the question? Yes, yes. So uh, what we know so far is, and we have to understand that this is all based on the information we have, right? So what we had is we had the SARS and we have this SARS-2, that is the virus, and COVID-19 is the manifestation of the symptoms of that virus, right? So there, one is uh, the, the disease itself and the other is the virus. The virus is the SARS-2. Um, and so when the first cases started appearing, what people did, of course, they sequenced this and they tried to match the DNA sequence of the virus to what we knew. 
And it turns out that the closest related virus that we know, it was isolated from a bat, right? So this is why all the fingers were pointing at the bats, because the closest known virus that we had came from a bat. It doesn't mean that the bat passed along this virus. Does it mean that it's a, a, a bigger likelihood that this was the source? Yes, of course, it's, it's, it's more likely, but there's no direct connection between patient zero, which still we cannot find, and the bat passing the virus to this patient, right? So while, while we, we've been hearing a lot about this connection and this intermediate host, the thing is that when we look at, in detail at the sequence from, uh, that came from, from these bats, uh, from this horseshoe bat, when we look at the sequence, we see that if we took that virus directly from the bat and we put it in a human, it couldn't infect us. Why? Because one of the uh, most important proteins that the bat needs here, in, the, the bat, sorry, the virus needs in order to be able to enter our cells is one protein that is called S, it's the spike. So if you think about the corona, you have like this ball and you have like these spikes, right? So this protein is the one that is recognized, is being recognized by one of the receptors in our cells. And this is the entry point in, into our cells. The structure of that protein from the virus that was isolated from bats is incompatible to uh, be able to enter our cells. So the reason why the pangolins came, came into the picture is because, in, and we are not biologists, we understand this from the wildlife side, but um, there are certain processes where, for example, if a pangolin had different coronavirus and then acquired the SARS, there's a pro there could be a way that this protein that is needed to enter our cells can be um, through a recombination or through mutation in an intermediate host. They can acquire this different protein that will allow them to enter our cells. This is an oversimplification of the process. But the thing is that we are looking for something that is called the intermediate host, right? Is this animal that could um, potentially uh, serve as a bridge between what we thought is the source, that it could be bats. At least we know that the closest thing found so far is in bats, to something that could actually infect humans, right? So these are, this, this epidemiological bridge is it's what they're trying to find. And this is why the pangolins came into place because somebody had some samples from pangolins that were suffering some kind of pneumonia. And when they started analyzing, they find a coronavirus that is similar to the SARS-2. It's not exactly the same, and it is not the one that is infecting us now. But they see that in this case, something that uh, evolutionary, you can assume that came from something without the spikes, in the pangolins, you find it with, this, with the differentiated protein that will allow it to infect humans. So this is the importance of an intermediate host. And this is the missing key so far. Um, this will aid in preventing future crisis, but it won't help us solve what is going on right now. Like, it, the, the virus right now is being transmitted by humans. It's human to human. And later on, I see that there's some, some questions about if other animals or pets or wildlife can play any role here. And we will address this later on in this session. But yeah, that's why in general, bats and pangolins have been at the center of this. Because what we knew, the, the virus that is um, currently circulating humans, the closest thing that we knew came from a bat. And the pangolins are one of these candidates to be the intermediate uh, host that may facilitate this going into the humans. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Luis. And I realize that we have around 34 minutes left for this uh, session. So, so please, I think yeah, it's good. We are really appreciating the responses. They can try to at least uh, uh, answer quickly and then, but with a good detail so that we can then get some, as many questions from our participants going on. Thank you. So right to the next question, Macy from UK is asking, what will the outbreak mean for bat conservation globally? I'd like to take that. Uh, it's still too early in the game to understand exactly how will this uh, new coronavirus affect the work we do 
on bats and affect bats abroad. Uh, there's people out there right now in the United States uh, doing experiments to see if this coronavirus is going to be able to, uh, to infect uh, bats of the, in the American continent, number one. And like, Vickis, like Luis Vickis was saying, uh, one thing is that you are infected, and another thing is that you get sick. So this is going to be very, very important to understand what is the, what's the uh, outcome of this whole thing. Regardless, uh, this is clearly a game changer. This pandemic has been teaching all of us, everyone in the world, we have been learning things about ourselves, about the world, about the economy, about politics, about everything with this pandemic. This means that the world is not going to be the same from now on. But it also means that there's already the next pandemic is already in the works. It's coming. And that is because of the way humans have interacted with the environment, that we have destroyed it in many ways. We have made it simple and we have made it easier for those pathogens out there to create outbreaks. There's outbreaks out there, no doubt about it. We need to, to get ahead of the game and, and realize that one of the first lines of defense against the next pandemia is conservation. If we protect the habitats, that is a big step forward towards protecting ourselves from the next pandemic, protecting the world against the next pandemic. Thank you so yeah, I much. Think I, will add, I think I will add to those lines that... Um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. That it's also very imperative that we educate, educate the public because if misinformation keeps going on, the conservation implications that we're gonna have, have on not just bats, but in general, just with wildlife, um, we might have some other human activities like you know people going to to colonies and just start setting fire there or just it, and that could be harmful for those um, wild populations but also for humans because they're exposing themselves to these environments as well and they're increasing this is their action with wildlife again just because they want to take part on this uh, control strategy without being well informed. So I think this is really important for us to try to do these really huge campaigns of educations and have the governments on our side um, with you know, law supporting this as well. Thank you, thank you so much. Next on, Melissa from Canada asks, uh, the, field, the field season is coming up and I've already seen many US biologists canceling spring batch surveys. Are we being overly cautious? Well, again, I, I just said a, a few words about that. Uh, I think it's not overly cautious, uh, given the uh, uh, morbidity of this thing and the, the way it easily transmits, and the fact that it, we already know that it can be transmitted to other species, including tigers. Uh, it's too early in the game to make the decision. However, because it's too early in the game to make the decision, we need to wait for the bi virologists and the epidemiologists to tell us what are the chances that this actually conveys to, to bats. I myself, I'm, I'm stopping short at this point in time. I don't think we're gonna go to the field. I'm sorry to my students who are uh, listening to me here because this is the first that they hear. Uh, but I don't think we're gonna go into the field until we have a clear view of what is going to be the next step in this pandemic. I can, I can add something quickly to this. And <coughs> the fact is that um, if there's, um, we don't know how this is gonna behave, right? So we have to lead by example. We have to lead by example and the same way that we're socially distancing ourselves from others to try to protect them uh, in the population that might be higher at risk. Uh, we should um, try to social distance ourselves from wildlife, not indefinitely, but as, uh, until we understand better how this will behave. We have, and I see that one of the questions that is around and is the one that supposedly is coming next, I think, it's about the tiger. 
And yeah, okay, we, we see that this tiger is in the US. For those who don't know, a caretaker was asymptomatic uh, in this zoo in New York, uh, in the Bronx, I think is. And the three, six or, was it six or was it 10 pellets? Amanda, you remember how many? The what? Sorry? How many animals get infected, supposedly? I don't remember. Well, uh, six, ten tigers uh, or fillets in the zoo um, were tested and tested positive for uh, the SARS-2, uh, right? So we don't understand how the dynamics is working now, and we just have to be patient and let research come through. Uh, because the, what we don't want is we don't want to put ourselves and the wildlife at risk at any point, right? Yeah, we want to be in the safe side. And I think on those lines, I know that already um, it's important to consider also our closest relatives. So other primates in the world, especially, you know, endangered, endangered apes, for instance, um, they have already been doing like a lot of effort, changing guidelines, trying to be more cautious about um, all this research with chimpanzees and gorillas and who knows like we also probably will have to be as, ca as ca cautious with other primates in the new world as well um, it's we still don't know so it's it's really better for us to be on the safe side and wait for results so yeah okay Thank you so much. And actually, your question, your responses are leading to the next question from Jennifer, who is asking from Mexico. And her question is on how a tiger zoo is positive to COVID-19. COVID uh, there is no more an interspecific barrier. I don't know how you can respond to that. Is there no more uh, interspecific barrier for this? So I, think, I think we already kind of went through this a little bit. Um, so it, we have to think that, well, bats are really phylogenetically distant from humans. And as, as um, Luis just explained briefly, usually when there's a spillover event from a bat to, to humans, there's an intermediate host in the middle where um, you have this barrier, um, the species barrier being jumped. And so, in this case, it looks like, you know, there's, there's, there have been examples with other outbreaks where there has been another intermediate host. Uh, with the first SARS outbreak, it was a civet cat. And there has been other examples with other viruses where there were pigs or camels or um, horses even. And um, we still don't know exactly how this works. This is basically, um, as Bika said, just going through these phylogenetic analysis with the, with the genetic material that we have. Um, but we're trying to make sense of this and understand how this could have happened. Um, right now, they have found these in, in tigers and they have also found some cats being positive for this. Um, but we don't know the implications of, we don't know if they get as sick as we do because their immune system is also different from us. Um, we know, like we're just understanding how the pathogenics of these works in humans, and we're not physicians, so we're not studying how that works on us, but we, as a general public, have a general understanding of how it works as a, you know, like a, uh, okay. kind, kind of like a flu disease, but it doesn't really have to work the same way in other mammals. Like with bats, we know that it's more a fecal pathway uh, where they found it more in, in feces, but in humans it has to be found in feces or it doesn't, um, it doesn't um, transmit through the fecal pathway. It's more like a airborne disease in that sense. So okay. It's, okay. it's very okay. different. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, one asked, does COVID-19 affect bats the same way as human beings? Could we estimate the infectivity or severity of a virus by looking at its behavior in different hosts? We think for that? We sure. still don't know. It's too early in the game. Uh, I don't think there's any reports of uh, bats with pneumonia anywhere um, as a result of this. But I, as I said, there's people that are uh, doing those experiments right now. So uh, I, I, I think with, with this, um, so 
we have been said this uh, quite a, a lot now, the, the evolution that, the coevolution that the virus had had with bats, it's very different from what we have, like the, cor the coronavirus that we have found in humans. So usually the coronavirus that we find in humans are um, causing some pulmonary diseases. And it, it behaves, that's where at the beginning people were talking, it's just another flu, because we do have other flu-like uh, coronavirus that are really common in humans. Um, but in bats, it looks like it's different. We don't really, since they have had their own history, it doesn't cause a disease. First of all, it's really hard to find an um, ill animal in the wild because usually if you go sample that night, that wild animal probably didn't you know, leave the cave that night because he didn't feel um, so energetic or they don't they just don't show signs of disease because it's a weakness sign. So wild animals never show weakness. Um, I mean, contrary to dogs that they would show weakness so you can pay attention to them. That's their evolutionary history be because they have been dealing with humans and we, they know how could they gain attention by, by showing those um, symptoms. But wild animals usually don't show like general um, symptoms. And so that first makes it hard for us to see a wild animal being sick. And also they, we don't, like in, in experimental conditions in the lab, we haven't found um, like symptoms in them to say, well, it's causing a disease. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they just deal with viruses uh, very well without showing any uh, symptom and they sometimes recover sometimes they don't but they don't really show a lot of symptoms so it's it's just it's not the same uh, pathway also of, of transmission from humans human to human and bat to bat so we're just trying to understand how it works in our system which you know human human system and we're trying to understand also how it works in the natural world so we could not for a treatment, but to understand where it comes from and to have more prevention and control strategies for the future. Thank you so much. Um, just to remind our participants again, please, we are receiving your questions through Slido. So go to slido.com and type in the code 77525, I repeat. We are receiving your questions through Slido. So go to slido.com and type in the code 77525 to enable us to receive your questions and then forward to our uh, amazing speakers. And it's right there, you can see. So moving on next, Malute Adach in Germany is asking, how do we deal with sharing of information versus making people scared? Like birds might be the source, but are not the reason. What is your advice on sharing Facebook posts? Uh, it's very, it's very clear. I'm going to jump into this. Uh, it's, uh, it's very clear what we can do and that we should do. Uh, one, there is a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of even experts who say things halfway through. They say half words that refraining from stating the whole thing. What we need to know is basically that bats are absolutely essential for every ecosystem and for our everyday lives. That is an absolute given. We have demonstrated, many people around the world have demonstrated that life without bats would be completely different. We would lose the battle against uh, agricultural pests. Uh, we would lose a lot of uh, uh, agricultural products that benefits our everyday life. And we would lose the uh, functioning of ecosystems everywhere in the world. Uh, now, the other thing is, the origin of, uh, of this, these, all of these diseases uh, is the interaction between humans and the environment. And that we cannot change. That may be, but there's absolutely no evidence, no evidence of connect, connecting a bat that may have infected a human being, not in the original SARS episode in 2002, 2003, not in this episode, not in the Ebola episode, not in many others. There is no evidence for that, but it may be that the original virus was present in bats. How did it go all of that chain 
into humans. There's a long line of events, but mostly it's that humans have been playing to be gods. We have been playing with the environment. We have been deforesting, degrading the forest, fragmenting, etc. And that is what releases the possibilities of these outbreaks to 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 become uh, to become pathogens for us. Basically, we're talking about the pathogens being diluted somewhere out there in the in the pristine intact forest, and and bats and pathogens and civets and pangolins and everything they are coexisting there, but at low densities. And when humans come in and disturb, then two or three of those opportunistic species that like those disturbed conditions become super abundant and their pathogens become super abundant and that is a perfect setting for the next pandemia. Now, if on top of that, we add the unnatural coexistence of wild animals in these wet markets where you have uh, pangolins and birds and civets and sometimes bats, but let me tell you, bats are really rare in those wet markets, very, very rare. It's true that some people hunt bats out there and sell them directly to the to the supermarket to the uh, restaurants. But uh, in the markets, it's very very rare that you find it. Regardless, the fact that you find you can find day in and day out that you used to find in the clo now closed markets of China a pangolin sitting on top of a civet and defecating on top of the civet and the urine and the saliva and everything falls on the civet and the civet. Uh, the civets fall on, on the bird that is underneath, etc., etc., is a perfect way of promoting that. My main point here is that we have a number of, of uh, um, messages out to send out there. One is the importance of bats for ecosystems and for our well being. Number two, killing wild animals is not going to solve any problem whatsoever. Okay. Solving the people's interaction. Uh, uh, unsustainable people's interaction with the environment from eating wild animals to stacking uh, different species of wild animals on top of each other may be a factor and if we curb and if we control those elements we might have a leg up before the next pandemic please okay. all you need to do is to promote the good name of bats and the fact that it's not the bats are not the culprits it's been, uh, it's, it's about uh, 1,300,000 people that are infected now in the world. Every one of those 1,300,000 have been infected by a human, not by a wild animal. We don't even know what the wild animal, what the first link was. So from 1.3 million people infected from human to human to one individual infected by a wild animal, that's a huge expanse, huge distance. Let's not malign wildlife because wildlife is not to blame and wildlife is absolutely essential for the ecosystems. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. That is quite in-depth and yeah, I agree with you that we need biodiversity and we cannot always uh, question the role of biodiversity when pandemics hit us and try to criticize them just for being out there in nature. Thank you so much. Let me remind us that we have around 15 minutes to go and we're still receiving your questions on Slido, and we are happy to keep receiving and asking our wonderful speakers. Next on, I have a question from Brian, he's asking from Kenya. His question is, what is the role of youth, youthful ecologists in bat diversity or in bat genetic studies and ecosystem management, especially in global South nations where mentorship and uh, lab infrastructure lacks? So, moment. sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? The question was, how, what is the role of youthful ecologists in bat diversity and genetic studies in ecosystem management, especially in global south where mentorship and lab infrastructure lacks a lot? I guess I'm going to jump in uh, while uh, Luis and, and Amanda uh, gather their thoughts. Uh, it is true that there is a big imbalance in the technical capacity, in the scientific capacity in the, in the, in the entire world. 
this is exactly why uh, a group of us uh, in the developing world have been joining forces to expand the capacity of the developing world. It's not, we are not coming to Africa to teach them how to do things. We are joining forces with Africa and with Asia. We all, we're all facing the same threats and the same challenges. Very few people knowing, knowing about this, very few people with uh, with the capacity to go and study bats, go and study whatever, uh, and, and we share the same things. We're all the time trying to reinvent the wheel in, in an independent system, in the, in the independent setting. Nobody from Africa is talking to people from Latin America, no one from Latin America is talking to people from Africa. It's mostly people from the North, mostly Europe and the US, who are coming to tell people in, in Europe, in uh, Africa, or coming to people in, in Latin America to tell us, or going to Asia and coming to tell us. But there's no horizontal connection. We have taken already the first steps to do this Global South uh, BATS network that is actually going to take care of that by, by weaving this network between African and Latin American experts. And in the near future, we're hoping to incorporate Asians as well. Okay. Anyone else wants to go or we go to the next session? Please. Yeah, when uh, you were asking about the role of, of uh, young ecologists, right? So this, this is a driving force, right? This is, this is people listening to this and how we communicate with, with each other and that we find a common ground that we can build up from, right? And uh, regarding sonatic disease, something that we need to really understand is that going out there and finding a path and uh, getting uh, the biodiversity from one animal is only telling me half the answer. Like with this coronavirus, we knew that there was a coronavirus that was similar to what is now affecting us since years. And the thing is that knowing the viral diversity of an animal only gets me halfway. I need to understand how this epidemiological bridges, the land use changes, the wet markets, bushmeat, uh, even global hunger, these are factors and everything is uh, interlaced, right? So this is the driving force and young, ecolo young ecologists and not just ecologists, we're, we're talking about interdisciplinary work now, right? We need veterinarians, we need physicians, we need sociologists, we need a lot of people working together so we can understand how these viruses and things that we're finding and pathogens that we're finding in wildlife, what is the likelihood of this becoming a pandemic? Right? And we need to understand all this relationship that is in between. We cannot just wait for the pandemic to explode and then it happens what we're doing now, right? We're scramming to see what we can solve because we didn't understand the drivers that could take that virus and make it go live for just a matter of speak, right? So these drivers, this is the task for the next 5, 10, 15 years, whatever we want to put the time frame on. We need to understand how our choices and how our markets and how uh, the products that we chose to buy, how all this is connected to um, climate change, to land use, land use changes, and how this is also connected to all this disease, all, all these pathogens that might be in wildlife. And because of us keep pushing into the, the, the forest and into the wild environments, we are getting, we're increasing the car contact rate with this pathogens, and this is where the spillovers happen. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm getting to our final questions. We have a question from Mark, who is uh, asking from Trinidad and Tobago. His question is, why are bats particularly uh, risky for zoonotic disease, this disease transmissions to human beings? I, I'm sure you might have answered, but maybe you can just give a wrap up on this. Okay, I think I'm going to talk because I've been quiet. <laughs> sure. um, so I, I think it's important to, I, we have mentioned a few of the things that make them so special as reservoirs of, of pathogens. And one of them is their evolutionary history and their high diversity that they have. And linked to that high diversity, we know that uh, bats are all over the world, uh, but in, the Antarct in Antarctica. 
and they have all these different ecological niche and they could um, also prevail in ecosystems where humans have made a lot of perturbations and they could also live in human infrastructure. So we know that they also move a lot and they could probably move these long distances. And so they, they, they just, it just makes them a really good animal to be able to transmit this. This is just because of their ecology, right? If we had elephants being highly pathogenic and they're only in this really reduced environment, they probably would not that be that, um, you know, whiskey. But then if you put all these other things together with all this diversity and pair with that diversity, they also are highly diverse with the pathogens that they carry just because every organism in life has their own pathogens and their own evolutionary history. So yeah. that, you know, alone just makes them really interesting to study. But then you have a lot of human pressures because every time we think of these viruses as something new, they actually are not new. They have been there for a while. Um, and so they're new for us. They're new because they're interacting with humans for the first time because we are encroaching their environment. We are forcing them to go forage in new areas because we cut that forest and we put a crop and now they have sometimes go to those crops and find another place where to have a roost. So we're just increasing our probability, our that interface where we interact with wildlife. And that's important to consider because just, you know, because just explain this briefly, but this is a big driver. We are changing the environment in such a high speed. And sometimes our impacts are not really clear to our side. Like sometimes we think of things like, you know, changing the landscape, but there are other impacts like um, polluting the air or polluting the water or pesticides and things like that that could also erode uh, wildlife's immune system. So when animals are also under high stress, they could lower their immune function. And when they have these stress conditions, they could also produce, they could be more, more uh, virulent because they could produce more pathogens in them. And that happens with humans too. When we're under a lot of stress, we get more sick. And, and, and we're just making that pressure in wildlife all over, like it's not just changing the environment. And again, I think it's, it's really, we cannot oversimplify the problem because it's dangerous. We might oversimplify the solution as well. And we have to think of us as being part of this really complex environment. We're not isolated. We constantly forget about this, but this is really crucial. We're part of this environment and everything that we do to our environment affects us directly sometimes like this pandemic but sometimes indirectly and we have seen so many evidence for things like climate change that has had a lot of impacts for us sometimes in our daily lives now and and, and i mean the same thing is happening with these outbreaks all over the world so this is not an isolated thing that happened it has been happening. And if we continue to do these pressures, it's gonna to continue to happen. And okay. um, yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, it could not be put any simpler than that, Amanda. And we really appreciate the three of you for your immense wealth and uh, well, information and knowledge to, and also giving time to share with us. And just before we let you go, and we realize there's so many questions that have been shared and we'll try to still carry on the conversation on social media, but please, I invite the three of you to also like give us your parting shots and I mean your whatever you can tell to the world uh, in these pandemic times. So please take the floor in no particular order. You want to start, Amanda or Luis? I can start. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's a different time, right? Everybody's living in their house, uh, completely locked down, and the thing is that this we don't know how long this is going to take. But I think one of the important things is, is one is finish. We shouldn't forget about what happened. We shouldn't forget about how we failed in the beginning to understand these drivers that Amanda was just mentioning. And this is where research needs to go. This 
is the task for the next years. We need to understand how the changes and the choices we made as consumers as well, how this changes the environment and how when we're messing with the balance of the environment, things like pandemics happen. And I'm not talking about karma or something like that, right? It's simply that we have this, the, the ecosystem is there and we're part of it. And our actions have consequences and this could be a domino effect. So my take home message is stay safe, wash your hands. Um, uh, especially if you're going to handle animals. If you don't need to handle animals at the moment, it's not, it's not crucial to do it. Stay home for a bit. Let the research come in. And once this is finished, we need to come together and we need to find a better way of understanding how sonotic disease and how the, these drivers affect not only the health of the animals, but also our health. Amanda? I think I would, um, I'm not going to repeat what Vika said, but I would also say um, that we know that there's still a lot to, like, there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of knowledge gaps, and that's what we have to start trying to focus on right now, because it, it looks like it's, it's really important. It could give you some answers for um, new further steps. Um, but on those lines, I think there's a big, big, big knowledge gap in the tropics, and that's where most of the biodiversity is. That's where um, also these new pathogens could come up. That's what everyone says, right? Just because there's a lot of biodiversity there, there has to be a lot of biodiversity in pathogens as well. And also this is where a lot of countries with lower income are, and where a lot of pressures from the environment are. So there's like these growing populations, they're changing the landscape, and they're putting all this pressure in these sites. And as you mentioned in one of the questions, um, there just sometimes there isn't enough human capacity yet. There isn't enough uh, research done in these places. So I will just kind of call for more research to this area. And I, I, I mean, I know I'm biased. I'm also a, a tropical, uh, from a tropical country myself. And I think, I think it's where a lot of research is missing. And I, I will just say, uh, you know, welcome and, and start doing more research here. Okay. And I would like to close by, by please reiterating, please keep this in mind. Bats are a lot more important than you think. Uh, bats are not the culprits whatsoever at all. Bats are not going to give you coronavirus. Bats will never do that. They will not give you coronavirus. The fact that you see a bat flying outside your house doesn't mean that next morning you're going to have coronavirus. That is absolutely out of the question. That is not going to happen. Uh, Vicky said something that I'd like to touch again on. He said something like, if you touch a wild animal, wash your hands. Well, if you don't touch an animal, a wild animal, wash your hands. You wash your hands, period. You <laughs> wash your hands. Uh, and... and uh, they far outweigh the risk by the benefits that they give us. Uh, but it's also true that viruses are everywhere. We cannot forget that. Viruses are everywhere. If I do this right now in my computer, I have new viruses right here. There's many studies, for example, one in which they took 2,000 2, samples from the subway surfaces in New York City. They found almost 1,700 different bacteria and viruses 1,700 bacteria and viruses from, uh, and, other, and other microorganisms from when half were unknown. And then another example, uh, people in a meeting took uh, 60, only 60 uh, cotton swabs, and they asked one individual per swab to do this in your belly button and give it back to me. And then they looked and sequenced for all of the microorganisms in our belly buttons. They found all kinds of viruses and bacteria, including many undescribed species in our belly buttons. Are we going to be afraid of our belly buttons? Are we going to seal our belly buttons? No, of course we're not going to seal our belly buttons. So please keep common sense, keep your head in place, don't lose it, and respect bats and save bats and promote this information. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, the three of you. I think that was, I mean, some very punchy ending and parting shots that we cannot really afford to under, under uh, estimate. So, so we really appreciate the fact that we've been brought together by this common pandemic and we can never blame birds or any animal for that matter. I think we have to blame humanity. And so the parting shot for me, I think, will be that we have to take care of ourselves in the meantime, but we have to rethink how we work or how we engage with nature. We have to for sure protect birds and we have to continue the conversation around uh, biodiversity conservation and protection of nature so that we can secure our, our own survival as humanity. So then thank you so much for everyone who's been part of this. We especially thank the three remarkable speakers for creating the time and the energy to be uh, with us. We thank the more than 300 uh, participants who uh, saved uh, their time to come and be with us and participate in this case question and answer session. We also recognize we could not answer most of your questions like I stated before. I would want to encourage you to go on our social media handles, which is uh, across our social media platforms that Youth for Nature is shared on your screens. Let's carry this conversation onwards and also try to sign up with us to ensure that we keep engaging more for nature-based solutions and how everyone who is here and beyond can participate in making the world a better place through working with youth, through working with uh, uh, local communities and through working with nature for posterity. So thank you so much. And I cannot forget to thank the role of the Youth for Nature team, led by Marina, Vania, Haley, Caroline, Lujulo, Emily, and so many other young people who have been able to curate and bring together this session. Have been a wonderful host, Kaluki Paul Mutuko from Kenya. And until next time, take care and wash your hands, exercise <laughs> social distancing, and let us uh, uh, ensure that we are very cautious and protect ourselves because there's still a future beyond COVID-19. Thank you so much and have a wonderful time from wherever you are. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.